One short announcement is that um, we have a, a t-shirt and sweatshirt and apparel sale uh, at lunch in the uh, uh, top level of the dining hall. We have uh, fabulous goods with the IAS logo and uh, at very good prices. And you should know that this is how we're planning to finance next year's PITP uh, workshop. So be sure to uh, patronize our uh, store. Um, the, uh, the speaker this morning is uh, Derek Richardson from the University of uh, Maryland. Um, so a little background, the study of granular flows is one of the most interesting um, modern areas of condensed matter physics. It's the study of uh, how large numbers of rigid bodies, colliding rigid bodies, uh, interact. It's relevant uh, on Earth for everything from understanding avalanches to figuring out how to get you know, 100 aspirin into a pill bottle as quickly as possible uh, on an assembly line. Um, the subject is also relevant in astrophysics, but the additional uh, complication um, is uh, adding uh, gravity uh, as well as um, interactions uh, between the particles. Uh, it's essentially uh, uh, HPH instead of SPH, that is it's hard particle hydrodynamics instead of smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, and Derek and his students are, uh, uh, represent probably the leading uh, group in the world. Uh, I should also say they're probably just about the only group in the world. Um, but um, it's a subject with a remarkable variety of uh, applications uh, in astrophysics. Derek. Thanks, Scott. Is the mic on? Yeah, it sounds like it. So this is the last talk of the week. I appreciate you all being here. Um, so let's start off with a serious question. How many people saw Harry Potter last night? Very good. Is there any good? Good, yes? Yeah, all right. Yeah, it's on my agenda for this weekend. Um, yes, thank you, Scott. And today I'm going to talk about the rigid body problem in n-body in n -body context, hence the strange title. Uh, these are my partners in crime. Um, mysteriously, I've omitted uh, some of the original authors of the code I use, PKDGrav, uh, because they're always implicitly involved in everything that I do. But um, Stephen Schwartz is here today. Uh, Randall Prine is my other graduate student at the University of Maryland. A very brief outline. Uh, we're going to be talking about collision null systems. So you've heard a lot about collisionless systems this past week. Well, let's talk about what happens when we really care about the collisions themselves, physical collisions. Uh, I'll start off by telling you how you would simulate sphere-sphere collisions. That's the simplest problem to do. Uh, so what are the methods and what are the complications that you encounter? And then we're going to generalize to the case of uh, non-spherical rigid bodies, more complex shapes and how we can model those in an n-body code. And if I have time, I'll talk to you about some new directions that our research is going, uh, modeling cohesion in solid bodies, and some more aspects of granular dynamics that Scott mentioned. Uh, now, a lot of the formalism here you'll find in this paper, Richardson et al. 2009, it's a review paper. So I encourage you to, to look at that. There's a link to it from my lecture, um, my suggested reading on the wiki site. There's also the full PDF of this lecture up there, so don't worry about trying to scribble down all the equations and stuff. Okay, so collisional systems. So what's the difference? Here we are actually concerned with um, not only close gravitational encounters, so two individual particles, and we're really treating them as individual particles now. They're not representing some distribution of, of masses, and they can have a close encounter and they may even touch. And the condition for them touching or coming into collision is that the uh, magnitude of their separation be equal to the sum of the radii. And I'll use this notation throughout. So little s's are radii, particle radii, and the r's are vector positions. Now, where do we encounter this in astrophysics? Well, really, most of the time, it's uh, restricted to planetary science. So things like planet formation, the accretion of planetesimals, uh, planetary rings, and also granular dynamics when we're looking at, say, regolith processes on the surface of an asteroid. Uh, but you could encounter it in principle with things like stars. Stars can collide, it's extremely unlikely, but in the densest systems it could happen. But the crucial difference with the star collision is that the tidal interaction prior to contact is going to be equally important as the actual physical collision. Whereas here we're talking about rigid bodies that do not deform before they come into contact. So just a few examples. Um, again, it's the last lecture, so lots of movies. I usually show lots of movies in my talks, but uh, even more today. Uh, so planetesimal accretion. So here we're interested in how gravity plus collisions involving rigid particles um, can allow us to grow uh, larger bodies. 
you'd have to include some kind of dissipation law, and I'll have more to say about that later. Uh, the possibility of fragmentation. Um, one way to get around trying to worry about actual um, solid objects breaking is to imagine that our big objects are made up of small pieces to begin with, so they're rubble piles. So here's some examples of smashing kilometer size rubble piles together at about their mutual escape speed. And uh, this is, dates back to 2000, Zoe Leinhardt, my uh, first graduate student. And here you can see we've managed to make a bigger uh, planetesimal, and if we have a grazing collision, it might take some of that mutual energy out of the system and um, eventually end up with a bound peanut. We see asteroids, by the way, that look very much like this, double-lobed uh, contact configurations. Here's another one uh, where we get a somewhat irregular shape and a little orbiting companion. And uh, you get these irregular shapes if these objects have spins initially before they come into contact. So that's planetesimal accretion. Um, I've got a few slides on rings here specifically for Alar, because Alar Toomer is here today, and he was the fellow who inspired me uh, a lot with um, doing these ring simulations as well as uh, Scott Tremaine. So in, uh, planetary rings are a wonderful laboratory for really amazing dynamics. And one aspect of that is the fact that we have a very high density of particles. They're self-gravitating and they're colliding. And uh, this simulation here, I've added an extra wrinkle, which is a, a moonlet. So we imagine some larger body embedded in the ring. And we can ask, uh, what does that do to the material surrounding it? So we have um, gravitational instabilities which form clumps away from the moonlet, but also you get accretion onto the moonlet itself. You'll notice a little bit of change in the density uh, both for and after the um, object. Uh, we're in a rotating frame, by the way, where we're fixed on the, uh, on the central moonlet here. And some of these patterns that are uh, the wake trails have been observed in um, uh, photographs of Saturn's rings taken by the Cassini mission, and that's detailed in a paper by uh, Tiscarano, uh, which I participated in showing uh, some simulations. Uh, that was uh, several hundred thousand particles. And then you have uh, groundwater dynamics, which is, uh, as Scott pointed out, a very exciting area of uh, physics because you have material that's behaving on, in some ways like a fluid, in some ways like solids, and the interactions between the particles can take place over large range scales. And so how do we treat that? Well, one way is with numerical simulations. So these are really old uh, movies I'm showing you here, and I'll show you some more modern ones at the end of the talk. Uh, but just showing some of the processes that we're concerned about in uh, n-body simulations of granular material. So here I have a little sand pile in 2D. You notice I'm piling stuff up, you get little avalanches, you build up some stress, you release, uh, all the particles move. Uh, I can dump stuff into a funnel, like filling the aspirin bottle problem, um, like that. And so here I've added the concept of walls inside uh, the n-body code. Now this is all the same code, PKD graph. Okay, I just added this, um, concept of solid barriers and so on. Um, here's filling a, a tube with particles. Uh, some of them are colored differently for very technical reasons, which if you're interested, I can tell you about later. And the coolest one, which is a rotating cylinder uh, resulting in mixing. So here I have a little bit of surface friction on the edge of the, rot of the cylinder, and it can uh, spin this stuff up and mix it around. OK, so how do we actually do these kinds of simulations? Uh, actually, why do we do these simulations? I'll do a little bit more uh, motivation first. Um, the poster child for rubble piles in the, uh, in the solar system is this guy, Itakawa, imaged by the Hayabusa mission as a Japanese space agency mission to this asteroid. It's only 500 meters across, and uh, this boulder really is perched on the end. I mean, this is basically a reaccumulated pile of rubble, as far as we can tell. There's, uh, there are some craters, but you can barely see them. It's mostly just reaccumulated fragments. So rubble is out there. And if we zoom in a bit, here's Itakawa. Look at this patch. This is a one meter scale bar here. So down to the smallest resolution, it's basically just rocks. And here's another view uh, close up of this body. Now, how do you say it's not, I'm sorry. Oh, these are, yes. The only thing holding this together is gravity, basically. Uh, it's extremely weak. If you're on the surface and you sneezed, you'd fly off. Um, but uh, it's enough when there's nothing else around there to hold this stuff together. And the properties of these things, which I call gravitational aggregates, are really quite fascinating and sort of non-intuitive because people aren't used to thinking about granular assemblies in very low gravity okay, and, and what properties they might have. So 
As time permits, I'll get to that as we go. Uh, and this was just totally cool. I don't know how many of you have seen the, some of the images from the Equinox mission from Cassini, where the, uh, the, uh, it's the Equinox, so the sun is in the plane of the rings, which allows us to get these um, really long shadows cast across the rings from objects that are embedded in the rings. So for example, here is the moon Daphnis in the Keeler Gap, and you can see it's casting this long shadow. Um, and you can also see the waves that are raised both fore and aft um, by the gravitational perturbation from this moonlet. But you can also see shadows from the pieces that are in the waves. So we're actually beginning to see some of the tiny pieces that make up the rings of Saturn and these sorts of images. And uh, cool movie. Again, this is just from the Cassini. So you can see how this structure just evolves as the uh, moon rotates around the planet. So there's rubble inside the rings, for sure. We now have pretty much direct evidence of that. Okay, so back to some more formalism. Um, what are the, there's actually some advantages to dealing with rigid bodies. Uh, the most important one is that there are no singularities. You hit something before you actually overlap its center. So we don't have to worry about the problem of uh, the uh, magnitude of the separation going to zero. And it means we don't have to include any softening. And we're not treating any statistical assemblies. We're actually modeling each particle one for one. You can also then write down what sort of um, time step granularity you need to model the dynamics correctly. Because it's just going to be, um, so one over the square root of g rho has units of time. Uh, so if you take some small factor of that, where rho is the maximum density of, of your particles, whatever, uh, you know, the worst case scenario, this is a, a very good time step. You don't need to resolve much lower than that. And so those are nice advantages. Now the disadvantage, or the challenge, is that you need to figure out when the collisions are actually going to occur or um, deal with them if they've already occurred. And so we need uh, an efficient neighbor finding algorithm. Now Volker just talked to us about an efficient neighbor finding algorithm incorporated in SPH. And in fact, it's exactly the same thing that we use here for, well, maybe a slightly different implementation, but the same concept is used um, in PICI DGRAPH. So what are the equations of motion? Well, they're exactly the same for point particles with no softening. Okay, so the acceleration on particle i is given by uh, this quantity here based on the masses of all the other particles. Okay, so we can solve that in the usual way. Any standard ordinary differential equation um, integrator will do. Uh, so Scott gave a wonderful outline of uh, the various possibilities. Now it turns out for this particular problem, the second order leapfrog is particularly advantageous and I'll explain why in a second. If you recall, we've seen this a few times now in slightly different contexts, but the, the kick drift kick scheme um, is the one we adopt. There's also drift kick drift, and Volker explained why kick drift kick is um, uh, marginally uh, preferred. So this, the idea is that you have computed the accelerations on all the particles. You take a half step forward in time to um, improve your uh, velocities or to, to predict your velocities. Then you take a full step using those predicted half velocities. Uh, and this is the drift step to get new positions at the end of the step. And then you uh, do a closing kick to update your velocities using the new um, acceleration. So in between the drift and the second kick, you have a recalculation of the gravity between all the particles. Well, the thing to notice is that uh, this step, the drift step, uh, we're updating the position linearly with respect to the velocity. So in other words, we're treating the velocity as a constant and we're updating the positions. So we can exploit that uh, in, within the approximation of the integrator, so to second order, um, when we do the collision search. We can just say, well, we'll pretend that the particles are traveling on little straight lines during this time interval and we'll look for any um, intersections. Now strictly speaking, it's a symplectic map there is no definition of the particle positions and velocities in between the time steps, okay? Uh, so we're making an approximation here, uh, but within, again, within the order of the, um, of the integrator, it's a pretty good one, and it simplifies things quite a bit. So then it's really straightforward to figure out when, a, when two particles will collide. If I define the uh, relative uh, position and velocity vectors like this, uh, then I know that the position after a time t, the relative position after a time t is just uh, the original position plus v times t. Uh, if I square that quantity and, equal, and set it equal to the sum of the radii squared, I get this equation, which I can, it's a quadratic, which I can then solve for t. 
And that is, uh, well, it gives two possible times. You take the smallest positive root, and that will be the earliest time that these two particles collide. You maybe have no solutions if they're not going to collide. You have to have r dot v less than zero so that the particles are actually approaching, or else you're not going to have a collision. Um, but under all those circumstances, if you get a positive t, then you know that's when the collision will occur. If that time is beyond the um, drift interval, you just ignore it. We're only interested in collisions that will occur within the current drift interval. Okay, so we go ahead and figure that all out. Um, but we, only, we don't want to do this for every single particle in the simulation. At least we don't want to do all the pairwise checks, right? Because to check all particle pairs for possible collision has the same penalty as a, a naive direct integration of gravity. It's an order n squared algorithm. So instead, we're going to want to use a tree. So we take advantage of the hierarchical nature of a tree code where it groups particles together in some kind of proximal way. And uh, Volker, just a few minutes ago, showed exactly how you would step through um, the tree to find your nearest neighbors. So it's the same idea here for the collision search. Um, in fact, we call it n-smooth. We were actually using the smoothing um, kernels inside um, PKD graph to um, help with the, the uh, finding of neighbors. And we have to specify how many neighbors we want to look for. So if um, I could alternately specify the size of a search region, okay, I'll get back to that. But the way we do it is typically is to look for a certain number of neighbors and just check, take that number to be reasonably large so that you capture all the likely collisions. And you, there are ways to convince yourself that you're doing it correctly. So really, this, this whole um, collision search becomes the equivalent of an SPH smoothing um, step, essentially. So let me um, delve a little bit into the code, Picardy Grav slash gasoline, um, just to give you a little bit of idea of how this particular code implements some of the things that you've been hearing about uh, this past week. Name? Why the crazy name? Okay, so uh, first the crazy Picardy Grav name is explained here. So the P is, stands for parallel, the KD stands for the use of a particular type of tree, which is the KD tree. K meaning um, a variable, so multi-dimensional tree, and then the grav is from gravity. Um, this code was developed at the University of Washington by Tom Quinn and Joachim Stadl. Um, Joachim has since moved to Zurich, uh, and he's still working on this. He's working on Piketty Grav Mark II, in fact. Um, I'll explain a little bit about that later. Uh, it was originally designed to do cosmology. I was brought into the team to put in the hard sphere collision stuff and look at planet formation and these other applications. Uh, let's see. Now, you may have heard of gasoline, and um, it was mentioned, uh, Mike Norman mentioned it um, uh, a few days ago. That is the same code. It's Piketty Grav just with the SPH turned on. Okay, it's a compilation option. Uh, so Piketty Grav has SPH fully built in. Uh, why gasoline? Oh, well, I thought, I thought you meant Piketty Grav. Uh, gasoline just because it's, in, it's the gas version of the code, and the Olean because it sounds scary. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Pour some gasoline on that fire. Right? Um, now, the big drawback of Piketty Grab, unfortunately, is that it's not been released into the public domain yet. Okay, but we're actively working on this. This is something we want to do. We're just a little short on manpower and willpower, I guess. Um, but Yoakum is, um, even this, this week, Peter and I were both talking to Yoakum, and he's very keen on getting at least um, something out there that people can use. Um, if you're interested in using PKD Grav to do a, um, a problem beyond just the exercises that have been assigned, um, please come and see me. You know, it was perfectly fine for people to use the code, it's just that one of the original authors needs to be involved as the only restriction. Um, so if, if you're interested and um, uh, have a, a good problem, let's, let's talk. And by the way, I'm leaving today right after lunch, um, but I'll be back. <laughs> it's okay. I'll be back um, Sunday evening and I'll be here all next week. Okay, so I'm around. All right, so how does it work? Um, well, here's the KD tree on the left. This is basically a way of, an, another way of, of um, partitioning space to, um, to group particles in logical ways that we can exploit to do a fast algorithm. So in this particular case, um, it's, a, it's a bisection where we divide the number of particles in half, and we keep bisecting uh, until we have reached some limit to, below which we don't want to bisect anymore. Uh, this is 
One way of doing a partition, you've heard of the Barnes and Hutt tree as well. Here's another one, the spatial binary tree, where um, what we do first is take the particles and put, them, put a box around the particles, okay, and then cut that box in half and keep doing that recursively. This has the advantage, and we also squeeze the boundaries down, it has the advantage that the boxes remain a little more spherical shaped, if you want. They, they are a little more, they're less elongated than in this case, which has much more desirable properties as far as the um, accuracy of using the gravitational expansion, the moments of the gravitational potential uh, will be much more well behaved when you're dealing with um, uh, more uh, symmetric, if you want, um, particle distributions. So Piketty Grav actually has both of these trees implemented. It uses this one for gravity, and it uses this one for neighbor searching. Okay? And it turns out that the advantage of using this for neighbor searching is kind of minimal compared to this. So the new version of Piketty Grav has no KD tree in it at all, but it's still called Piketty Grav. So just for historical reasons. Okay, how do we actually um, do the tree walk? Um, the way to do this is, uh, was, well, we start at the top level, so we have this root cell, okay? And for any given, we don't do it by particle, we do it by bucket. So what's a bucket? A bucket is just, we specify some num minimum number of particles that we wanna deal with all simultaneously, okay? Because if you go all the way down to the single particle level in a tree, uh, you're just wasting a lot of time. So why not um, stop a, a little bit before you get to the bottom? And so use a bucket. Bucket will typically have eight or 16 particles in it, and you don't bother subdividing anything below that. And so then you can then look at one bucket and ask, which cells do I have to um, do a multiple expansion on to get the gravity from those guys? And which cells will have to open up, possibly all the way down to their buckets, and do an, uh, an individual particle-particle um, uh, calculation. So that's how it works. Um, so you define an, uh, an opening ball. So this is based on the critical opening angle that you saw in Barnes and Hutt's code. Um, but in this case, we just do a, um, a ball and, and do an intersect test. This is what Volker was talking about just a few minutes ago when looking for nearest neighbors. It's the same idea. It's a very quick thing you can do. You're looking for the intersection of a spherical region with um, a three-dimensional cell. I should have explained, by the way, this tree um, is a binary tree. We're doing just one cut every time, okay? So you can build up a binary tree. It's not an oct tree like in Barnes and Hutt. Um, and you, you maintain two lists, a cell list and a particle list. The idea is to build up the interaction list first. Don't do all the gravity calculations as you go. Just build up the list of what you need to do and then do the actual calculations. This has many advantages as far as um, uh, modular programming, and um, optimization and so on. Plus, you can use the fact that two buckets that are nearby are gonna have very similar interaction lists. So you don't need to, need to duplicate those lists. You can do a clever thing which amortizes them into something um, uh, much more efficient. So the details of all that um, we can talk about offline, but here's just sort of a graphical representation of what I've been talking about. So if I'm a bucket of particles, say C here, and um, I can look at this particular cell, which has a center of mass, it has some maximum dimension, it has a multiple moment, and it, uh, we have this opening radius. So in other words, how close do I, can I get to this thing without overlapping it? And uh, in this situation, this guy, everybody in bucket C can use the multiple expansion on everything inside this cell. Okay, so that's very nice. Um, however, bucket A, would have to open up this cell and look deeper to, before it could use any multiple moments. And you notice that B is straddling the radius here. It's not worth doing half uh, of the particles um, with the multiple force and half by digging deeper into the tree. Just dig deeper, okay? It's just not worth the time to make that decision. It's not efficient. And you'll also notice that uh, anything in this larger cell, D, would accept this multiple as well. Okay, so you can make just, uh, by partitioning things into larger quantities, you can make these amortizations, which improves the efficiency of the code dramatically. Um, some other things that are, are relevant to these kinds of codes, what is the expansion order? Piketty Grav uses the hexadecapole, hexadecapole. Okay, so you've got your monopole, your quadrupole, because um, there's no dipole, uh, the octopole, and then the hexadecapole is next. You might ask, well, 
why would you do that? There's like 300 plus terms just you have to sum up when you're computing the hexadecapole. Well, they did the test. They just actually worked out, you know, how much speed advantage do you get for all that extra calculation, and this one um, worked out the best. And how did they do that? They did it by writing a code which writes the code to do the multiple expansion to arbitrary order. Okay, so you can just test it very quickly that way. I don't even know what the next one is. <laughs> I don't think I want to know. <laughs> Does anyone know what's after hexadecapole? Look it up and tell us later. Uh, for cosmology, there's a, there is softening in the code and uses a spline soften gravity kernel, just like what uh, Volker was describing. Uh, periodic boundary conditions also, um, uh, the Ewald summation is available for cosmology. In planetary rings, we have funny boundary conditions, uh, sliding patch uh, boundary conditions, which I can talk about later. I don't have any special slides about that. Uh, time steps, for most of what I would do, I'm, I just use fixed steps, but multi-stepping is available as an adaptive leapfrog with the usual caveats that, again, Volker explained about um, multi-step and that Scott talked about as well. Uh, how does it all work? Um, the parallelism. Basically, you have, I, I love the way Piketty Gav was written, and I'm not taking credit for that because I came in late, but the idea is that they've, they've separated out the major components of the code. So there's this master layer which runs the show, okay? And it's done in serial. It controls the overall flow of the program. And as Volker pointed out, you want to spend as little time as possible in the master, okay, to get the most efficiency. Uh, then there is the processor set tree level. That's where uh, all instructions are sub submitted to all the processors. And uh, this, this has to do with the domain decomposition. So how do we distribute the particles across the processors? And then you assign tasks on those to, uh, to perform on those particles on those processors. And then what is actually done is at the PKD level, which is um, a serial bit of code, which is um, multi-instruction, multi-data execution of tasks on each processor. So if I wanna know what the total mass in my simulation is, okay, I can just pull all the processors to tell me what is the total mass on that processor that information gets um, propagated up, I add it all together, and I get the total mass of the system, just a very simple example. There is a th uh, another layer called the machine-dependent layer, uh, which is a separate set of functions which act as an interface to parallel primitives. This simplifies porting. Okay, so the PKD graph runs with PVM, pthreads, MPI, whatever you want, uh, and the reason it's, it's easily ported to those different architectures of um, parallel libraries because it's all isolated in a single um, set of C functions away from the science part of the code, okay? So that's a, a very nice way of, of dividing the tasks. Right. Yes? Uh, in the animation show, just like we did, there were a lot of parts from the bucket. Yes. Do yes. Do yeah, you can just squeeze. So remember, those cells in a tree are there for numerical convenience. They don't actually mean anything physically, right? So basically by putting, by cutting on the boundary and having some rule as to which one it's in, left or right, it's just very efficient uh, as far as uh, packing or if you look at the spatial binary tree with the squeezing, you squeeze it until there's um, particles on, on the perimeter, basically. So squeeze, you have to find the interaction. Yes, it's, it's, it's uh, very quick. Yeah, it's just a very quick, it's an order uh, base two log operation. It's a sort, basically. Yeah, it's a sort. Good questions. Uh, d domain decomposition, uh, again, there's been lots of talk about that, so I'm not gonna go into any detail. Uh, what we do in PKDGrav is a, um, again, it's a, it's a binary tree. And the cool thing is that uh, if I wanna submit um, a task to all the processors, part of, um, node zero is the master, and it has um, a link to itself and also a link to a remote processor. So it tells itself what to do, and it tells the remote processor what to do. And then at this level, this guy will say, okay, uh, now we tell processor two what to do, and then we tell processor four what to do, and then I do the stuff that I'm working on because there's no more processors. Okay, and so at the bottom level here, finally all the, all the um, nodes have the work that they need to do, and it's done in order log two time. So in other words, the instructions to go off and do the work is um, also um, distributed in order log two times. So it's very efficient as far as networking. And one thing I'll point out, Volker mentioned that bandwidth uh, in terms of communication is, um, 
is a limiting factor in, in body codes. Um, for PKD grav, it's actually the latency is more important because typically because the uh, PKD grav uses lots of small messages, okay, very small messages. So no, you don't need the bandwidth, but you need rapid response time in the network. So PKD grav um, pe performs particularly well in a shared memory architecture or with InfiniBand, um, fast Ethernet, um, uh, low latency configuration, stuff like that. That's a detail. Oh, one thing. Um, PKD grav divides processors among uh, pro particles among processors, not just spatially, but also based on how much work was done on each processor previously. And if a, one processor was getting too much work, it can push particles off to a different processor. So it dynamically rebalances based not only on the spatial distribution, but also on the amount of work that's being performed. Okay, so that's a nice feature. And you can make, you can put in whatever factors you want for that weighting. Uh, your standard plot, this is, goes back to December 2001 on a Cray T3E, if anyone remembers what those are. Um, there's three million particles, a particular opening angle, just showing the, uh, the usual scaling that you would expect uh, for a, a good parallel code as a function of the number of processors. Okay. Right, that's all I wanted to say about PKD graphs. So let's get back to collisions. Uh, so I, I left you with the question, well, how many neighbors do we need to search for if we're going to, to check to see if we're going to bump into anything. Well, <clears throat> the worst case scenario for equal sized particles is that I'm a single particle surrounded maximally by 12 other particles. Okay, so I know I have to search at least 12 particles. Okay, um, but you're, unless you're in the middle of a big rubble pile, uh, which is common with my simulations, but um, you'll typically be in a less dense situation. Um, and so your only concern really is if there's a fast moving particle that is uh, outside of your immediate neighborhood, which might hit you, okay? Um, so what we typically do is we use a smooth, uh, so this number of neighbors to search for, somewhere in the range of 16 and 32, um, but with a small enough time step that we're pretty confident that we're not gonna have any surprises. How do we know that? Well, we know what the fastest particle speed is, okay? And you multiply that by H, and if that distance is long compared to the search ball, for this number of particles, then you've got potential problems. From almost all the simulations that I do, that's never an issue. Um, however, it is possible to do the re reverse, which is to say, okay, I'm gonna look for all particles within a certain radius. So for example, I could take some measure of the this velocity dispersion, for example, and multiply by my time step. That gives a search ball. Uh, that could work in certain circumstances, but it can give you problems in others because you could end up with thousands of particles within that search ball if you have a very condensed uh, rubble pile that you're dealing with. So you gotta uh, pick and choose what's best for the problem that you're interested in at the time. Okay, so uh, we've, we've um, used the tree to predict when particles are gonna collide. We found that there's gonna be um, a collision. Okay, what do we do next? So how do we actually solve the problem? Well, um, all it is is an impulsive change in the velocities and possibly the spins of the two particles that were, uh, came into contact and you can basically derive the equations for how the um, velocities and spins changed based on uh, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. That's what all, all of this comes from that. Um, however, as you can see, there's a little bit of complexity here. So basically, um, uh, the change that your particle will feel will depend on uh, how much mass there is in the system, relative, you know, relative between the, the distribution of mass between the two particles, um, their speed, uh, in the direction of the uh, impact and possibly some kind of um, tangential speed as well. So it could be due to the fact that they're spinning, they come into contact and they feel a little bit of relative tangential speed or they're physically moving um, uh, a little bit parallel to one another. Uh, there's various factors in here. There's epsilon n and epsilon t. These things control the amount of dissipation that occurs when there's a collision. This is your familiar coefficient of restitution, the normal coefficient of restitution, how much energy you lose on a bounce. And then there's this thing, epsilon t, which is a sliding, um, sliding friction coefficient. You notice if epsilon t is equal to one, all of this junk goes away. The spins don't change, okay? So if you, um, uh, epsilon t equal to one means there's no surface friction. Uh, epsilon n of zero means perfect sticking. Epsilon n of one means perfectly elastic, okay? Uh, and there are other terms here. There are geometric factors that are determined for the fact that we're using the simple spheres. So this is gonna change when we make things harder. Uh, we have the moment of inertia of spheres coming in here. 
and we have these S's are basically uh, moment arms from the, from the center of the particle to the point of contact on the particle. We're asking how much torque there is around that uh, as a result of the collision. So you, you should be able to derive those yourself. It's just uh, sort of a, a straightforward exercise. Ah, well, that's an interesting question. So, um, uh, yes and kind of. <laughs> so, th the idea here is that this actually dates back to Newton. So, Newton introduced the concept of a coefficient of restitution when studying the kinetics of, of, of colliding bodies. And uh, we actually have him to blame for some of the problems that are going to come up, and I'll show you later. Um, and this is, yeah, this is the simplest formulation for perfectly rigid spheres, instantaneous single point contact. Okay. Uh, this parameterizes just about everything you'd be interested in. Now, of course, real collisions aren't a single point instantaneous, and so we'll get to that complication in a minute. Uh, but for most purposes, billiard ball type collisions, this will do. Okay. And again, this is all in the lecture notes. You don't have to write anything down or anything. Um, what about epsilon n and epsilon t? So rocks in space colliding, how much dissipation is there? Well, we don't actually know because we haven't been out doing experiments smashing asteroids together as much as we would like to. Okay. And, uh, similarly, epsilon t, I mean, what should the sliding coefficient be? Now, you can do stuff with terrestrial materials. Okay. You can do little ice ball experiments, bouncing ice balls together and see you know, how much dissipation there is. And we've done that and used the results in simulations of planetary rings. But what if you want to get to really big scales, like you know, meter-sized objects smashing together? You know, what, how much dissipation is there? Well, just talk to NASA and get some funding. So this happened just a few months ago. I was part of a th three-person team to actually determine the coefficient of restitution and sliding friction for meter-sized objects. First time it's ever been done. Uh, this is Dan Durda, who's the PI of the experiment, who works at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. We did the experiment at the San Antonio campus of the Southwest Research Institute. What do we have here? We have two one meter diameter um, balls of granite. Okay? They are three tons each in mass. Uh, they are suspended, as you can see, by cables to 40 ton cranes. Okay? These are the crane operators here. And this is a graduate student of Eric Asfog who is helping us. Uh, and then the idea is you pull the balls apart using some mechanism, which we took a little bit of trial and error to figure out. So we're actually pull these guys out with a little ratcheting mechanism and stuff. We need a quick release so that we don't die when we release these things. Um, I should point out this thing down here is a fiducial. The, the distance between the white lines is one meter. Okay. We have a, a video camera. This picture was taken by my iPhone. So I'm doing the camera. And this is the perspective that we have on the balls. And then we release the tension and let these things collide and see what happens. I happen to have a movie. The, well, we rented the, crane for a, the cranes for a week. That was the principal cost. It was, I don't know, something like $10,000, because it had the two operators plus the two cranes. They were there for us eight hours a day. Um, the, the, the spheres were quarried in China, milled in China, put on a boat, shipped to San Francisco, <laughs> and then driven to San Antonio. That cost $4,000. So you can do this yourself. This is run number 90. Uh, this is the highest impact speed that we dared attempt, because there was a limit to how much tension we could put on the, on the pulling strings. Okay, these, these cables can hold whatever, but. Uh, so let's see what happens. No sound, sorry. <laughs> so at this point, we're just getting ready. So this is, we actually have an audience that you can't really see back here, but it's the official people from, um, from Swiri overseeing the operation. Uh, these marks, by the way, are fiducials to help us with the camera. So uh, we're going to go back and just literally figure out what the speeds were prior to and after the collision. We can also look at any torsional motion as a result of the collisions and so on. Um, he's getting ready. That's a very important piece of equipment right there. And you'll see him do the countdown. Three, three two. One, release. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
we literally did not know what was going to happen. I mean, would these things break? I mean, that was probably about two meters per second, that in impact speed. And um, they, uh, they never broke. In fact, if we looked at the surface, there was just a tiny, tiny little bit of dust at the one little point of impact where they came into contact. You just brush it off. There's no other damage, no fracturing. We tried all sorts of things. Um, so these balls survived, and they're now being shipped somewhere where they can actually be broken. Um, at uh, Boeing Lab, they're going to shoot stuff into them. That's another story. Okay, anyway, so eventually we'll have epsilon n for at least that category of, of, of particle. All right, so um, just going back to the techniques, uh, how do we actually do collisions in parallel? If we have multiple processors all with their own little particles, how do we do this? Well, at the moment, we do it somewhat inefficiently, and we're currently working on a better algorithm. But basically, each processor will look at its own particles to see which, which one might have a collision next and tags that. Remember, this is just during the current drift interval. And that collision could involve a, a particle that's off processor, okay? We take care of that by using a, a, a cache system where we can borrow uh, particles from other processors. Uh, after every processor has figured out which is the, most, the next collision that's going to happen, the master decides among all those which one really will happen next and allows it to be carried out. That collision, of course, could now change all future collision circumstances because if particle one and two collided and are now going a different direction and particle three thought it was going to collide with particle one later, well, particle one's now moving in a different direction, I gotta go and recompute the collision circumstances. Fortunately, it's a very small subset of all the particles, and it's what we call a re-smooth operation. Uh, we don't change the ball search size or anything like that, we just go and look for a few limited cases to update their possible collision circumstances. Now, if there's a lot of collisions occurring during a drift interval, that can be a lot of re-smooths, but there's no other way around that. And then we keep going until all the collisions that occur within this drift step have been resolved. And then you've done a full step worth of collisions. You then move the positions to the end of step. You then calculate gravity. You close the kick. And away you go for the next um, round of integration. Yes, that's right. So part of the, um, so the question was about whether or not there can be sticking and how you might handle that. So during the collision resolution phase, uh, where, I, where I showed you those equations, uh, one possibility is that the particles will stick and actually become a complicated rigid body. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Or they could stick and be merged into a single sphere of larger radius, um, things like that. And that can all be taken care of as you go. And that might requ require deleting particles from a processor as two particles are merged into one. But that's all doable. Yeah. Fragmentation? Deformation. deformation. Uh, yeah, so we don't do deformation of spheres. We always want to deal with just spheres, okay? But I'll show you right toward the very end where we're starting to deal with deformation at somewhat larger scales using um, a Hooke's Law kind of thing. So it's, it's very cool. Well, hopefully there'll be time to show you that. Good for questions? All right. Uh, complications. Uh, here's the big one. Um, the way we're doing this is the Newton thing. Um, the restitution model of billiard ball collisions is only an approximation of what really happens, uh, okay? Because we're treating these collisions as being instantaneous, and we only have two particles colliding at a time. There's no triple collisions or anything like that. Single point contact, just a single little point uh, of, of, of contact. Um, this can unfortunately lead to numerical problems with our algorithm, okay? It's not. Uh, there are ways around this. So inelastic collapse, which I'll describe next, and uh, missed collisions because of round-off error. Okay, inelastic collapse. So um, as you're probably aware, if you take a, a, rigid, a, a ball and you bounce it on a floor, uh, it will eventually come to rest. Okay, but the code has no way of dealing with that. Right, the ball just has to keep bouncing, uh, sort of like Zeno's paradox. I happen to have an example here. So. Assuming it doesn't fall off the stage, it will eventually stop bouncing, okay? Uh, how do we do that in the code? Well, um, we don't, is <laughs> the short answer. Um, because you've fundamentally changed how that object is interacting with other objects if it comes to rest with respect to it. Uh, because then you'd have to worry about things like um, um, surface normals and, and so on. We don't want to go there. Uh, just, just to point out that this was a ball bouncing on the floor, but you can also have two balls in free space that are just going like this, 
and they will suffer the same problem, okay? So how do we get around this? Well, uh, the simplest thing is basically to specify a minimum impact speed below which you set the coefficient of restitution equal to unity. So you have no dissipation beyond some minimum speed. So that means the rubble piles or the ball on the floor is basically just vibrating ever so slightly, okay? And you can choose that minimum speed to be really, really small, much smaller so the energy involved in this vibration is small compared to anything else you're interested in, such as the gravitational binding energy of the object, okay? So in, in, in practice, it's not a problem. Uh, and there's, uh, this was implemented in a paper by Petit and Henault when dealing with uh, planetary rings. Okay. Uh, or you could try and force particles to come to rest with one another okay, and have surface normals and stuff. Um, but this is complicated, especially if you have self-gravity. Um, so we haven't, decided, we haven't chosen to go that route. Okay. Um, but just a little aside here. You can actually have this problem Okay, where the bounces want to, they want to do an infinite number of bounces in a finite amount of time, even without gravity. Okay, so you might think, oh, as long as there's no gravity, I'm fine. Well, that's not true, okay? And you can show it mathematically. So this is inelastic collapse in one dimension. If you imagine three particles, uh, the outer two particles are converging on the first one with speeds larger than the speed of the, first, of the, of the middle one, I'm sorry. Okay. You can write down a matrix equation which tells you what the post-impact speeds are after the two collisions are going to occur. Okay, this collision will clearly occur first, and then this particle will bounce into this particle for the second collision. And so I can write down what are my um, post-collision velocities as a function of the initial velocities and as a function of the coefficient restitution. So equal size particles and a constant coefficient restitution. You just write it down. Um, so you can see that, for example, particle one, its um, velocity does not depend on particle three. There's a zero multiplying it uh, because it hits this particle and then goes away before particle three has anything to say about it. Okay, well this is a matrix equation. I can uh, uh, work out what the eigenvalues are, and if I have an eigenvalue that's real and between zero and one, then this means that I can, uh, I have um, a sort of a repeating solution. I can apply this again and again, and so this, the, these velocities will all go towards zero, um, even though uh, there is no gravity in the situation. Okay. And it turns out for the three particles in one dimension, that critical coefficient restitution is 7 minus 4 root 3. You can solve it analytically. Okay. And it's a value of 0 0.072, which is very small. Okay. So most typically you'd say, like, this is probably 0.5. Okay. So this is very small, but nonetheless it happens. And then the thing that kills you is that you can show that as the number of particles on that line goes to infinity, that critical coefficient restitution below which uh, the system will inelastically collapse goes to unity, okay? And you can prove it analytically, right? It's there. So, and this is just a problem with this, the Newton concept of coefficient restitution. It's just an approximation of what really happens. What really happens is that there'll be flexing, the collisions aren't instantaneous, and so on. Uh, and the problem occurs in two dimensions and three dimensions as well. So how do you fix it? Well, uh, you can do something very similar to the sliding phase problem. You basically say, well, how far have I traveled since my last collision? And is that a fractional distance that's very, very small, say, compared to my radius? And if that is, set my epsilon n to 1 for the next collision. Okay. And so this just prevents things from getting into this nasty, um, completely numerically artificial situation of collapse. And typically, these, these factors are very small compared to the particle radius. Um, there's other, others, this is actually a big discussion in physics review letters about how to get around inelastic collapse and granular um, dynamics problems. One solution was, for example, well, if two particles collide, we can store some of their energy as a, vi as a vibrational mode in the particle, and then at some random time later, we stochastically release it and just results in a little kick, okay? Uh, so, you know, the people have been thinking about this and just trying to, to get around the limitations of the model. Um, probably the right way to do it is to model the deformation at the contact, but then we're talking a much more serious calculation. Okay, and just a few more things about complications. Um, if you have lots and lots of collisions, and now remember, I'm talking rubble piles that can contain 10,000 particles, and in a single time step, all of those particles could be rattling into each other, okay? Eventually, you can get into um, a round-off error problem, or just, you're just adding very small numbers together, and you, uh, you miss a collision. 
That means on the start of the next step, some of those particles may have drifted a little bit and now are overlapping at the start of the next step. Um, you want to minimize this. So you can reduce your time step, you can reduce v min and f crit. Okay? Um, but sometimes even that's not enough. And in that case, you have an overlap. Now, there's an entire set of uh, collision handling um, software out there which relies on this. They just wait until particles overlap and then fix them. Okay. I prefer the strategy of let's predict as well as we can when particles are going to collide and then deal with any uh, little miscreants afterwards. Uh, these are rare, but um, there are various ways you can deal with it. You can just abort, which is the default, so we're not allowed to overlap. Uh, you can trace the particles back in time until they're just touching. That's the typical thing that other codes will do. You can push the particles directly away from one another until they're just touching. You can merge them if you're actually merging particles. Or you can apply a repulsive force to push them away. And if you want to talk more about this offline, great. Uh, for single particles, basically, trace back is best. And if you're dealing with rigid bodies, the repulsive force is best. Talk about that offline if you wish. So, rigid bodies, finally. Okay, so the spheres are actually uh, rigid bodies. It's a special case, an ideal case of a round object, very easy to deal with. Calculating the force is very easy. There's only one point of contact and, and so on. So, but the trouble is that um, you don't encounter perfect spheres in nature. And in particular, this could lead to misleading, this could give misleading results, um, for example, in granular flow. If objects are perfect spheres, like ball bearings, maybe you get a different kind of behavior than if you have things that are more irregularly shaped. Okay, and this could also apply in planetary rings, surface of asteroids, and so on. So what do we do? Well, we take the next simplest generalization, which is to allow particles, these spheres, to stick on contact, to make a composite body, what I call a bonded aggregate. Okay, uh, so you get a more complex shape, but it's still made up of individual spheres. The advantage is that you can still use the tree code to compute the gravity, because you still have all these point sources, which are the spheres. Okay? Uh, you can also use the, the search algorithm to look for collisions between any of these particles. And you have simplified it because you don't need to look for collisions between particles in an aggregate, just particles between aggregates. Um, and the actual collisions, when they happen, are still just sphere on sphere. Okay? So that's very nice. And actually, you can, if you have enough spheres, if you get your resolution high enough, you can model any shape. If someone gives you the shape of an asteroid, you can just fill it with tiny little spheres. Okay? Now, some approaches are to use um, a polygon or, or a polyhedron, right? And then you can solve the gravity force of that, but it's much more complicated. And then figuring out collision circumstances is also much more complicated, although video game people are very good at uh, polyhedral intersect tests. Um, and so some, there's some researchers who are actually looking into that as to whether or not we can exploit video game technology to help with uh, the solution of collision on, uh, collisional dynamics. Uh, the other thing is to use like ellipsoids and so on, but spheres are just so much easier. So uh, at the moment, our code is the one that has the highest resolution. We can handle the most particles because we have spheres. So how does this work? Uh, so here's an aggregate, and this happens to be a fractal aggregate, sort of mimicking a dust grain. Um, we use a pseudoparticle to represent the center of mass, okay? And then we, we, um, that center of mass particle has other things. It has the inertia tensor of the object. It has the rotation state, in other words, the spin vector, and its actual orientation of the object, okay? All of that is stored in the pseudoparticle. And the constituent particles, the ones that belong to the aggregate, are, are very constrained in their motion. They can only move with the center of mass or around the center of mass. Okay. So I don't need to integrate those explicitly using the leapfrog anymore, because okay, um, we don't care about that. Uh, the, so the kick drift kick is only applied to the center of mass of this guy. But of course, this object is undergoing some complicated rotation. So how do we deal with that? Plus there's torques. So we have um, gravity torques and off-axis collisions that can alter the aggregate motion, both the translational motion and the rotation. So now. We've simplified some of the problem, but made other parts of the problem more complicated. Yeah, so how do we deal with that? Well, first, let's motivate this with a movie. So this is just to illustrate why um, gravity torques are important when you're dealing with irregularly shaped bodies. So two very similar shaped objects, they have slightly different spins. They're in an orbit around one another. I'm going to let them go, and you're going to see how we can translate 
um, uh, orbital motion into rotational motion and back and forth. Just, just very, very simple. This is an old movie, but it, it really does illustrate some of the points. So this is using PKD graph uh, to compute the gravitational torques and so on. There's not going to be any collisions here, but you can just see how these things, a nice little close encounter there, pushes the blue guy out further. Uh, you also see a change in rotation as, you know, you get a nice close encounter there, slows the rotation down, pushes the particles further apart, and so on. Whee! Okay. Um, each particle is, is, like I said, it's constrained to move with respect to the center of mass. So what I have is the center of mass motion, and I have the full description of the rotation. That tells me the speed of the individual particles. Oh, yes. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. So what are the governing equations? Well, they are Euler's equations of rigid body rotation, which are given thusly. Um, so it depends on the, um, th these things now are principal moments of inertia of the body in question. Uh, it's spin components and, uh, and a possible external torque, okay? And these um, inertia, tents, inertia moments and the spin components and the ends are in the body frame of the object, okay? So this is it. So you've, you've got some um, uh, axes describing the, the the body, and you're measuring these quantities with respect to those axes. So you can see this stuff in like a, a mechanics text like Goldstein, for example. Um, so this set of equations tells us how the um, spin vector changes as a result of external torques and also uh, coupled interactions. You can get you know, free precession and stuff like that. Um, but we need a little bit more. So those previous equations are a set of coupled ordinary differential equations. They're all ODEs, so that's good news. Um, but we still need three more vector equations to evolve the actual body orientation. So the, the principal axes of the body will react as the spin uh, state changes, and you then figure out how that works. And so that can be written like this. So the three components of the principal axes uh, change uh, on this basis. Uh, so how do you compute the principal axes? You get that by diagonalizing the inertial tensor. Okay, so you get your inertia tensor, and I'll show you a formula for that later. Uh, you use a standard diagonalization routine to figure out what are the principal axes, and then you refer everything to, those, um, to that body frame. And then you can use the equations as I just showed them to you. Now, the nice thing is that this diagonalization, which in principle can be annoying if you have a lot of particles in an aggregate, you only need to do it once. Okay, or when a particle is added to or subtracted from the aggregate. Otherwise, nothing, the inertia tensor remains uh, fixed. Right, so this, so this formulation is for the concept of a rigid body. So the concept of a rigid body is that the particles have no motion with respect to this, no translational motion with respect to the center of mass. Okay, now to do something more complex where you allow that, we use a different approach, which I'll show you later. Okay, so now you have those nine plus the previous three. You have 12 coupled ordinary differential equations, and you just have to integrate those any way you like during this drift step. So we're going to be rotating these things while looking for collisions, okay? That's all right. You just integrate forward to the point in time where there's going to be a collision, and you'll be fine. Um, and you don't have to use any... You can use whatever integrator you like. I happen to use a fifth-order adaptive runga kutta uh, because sometimes... Um, because there's, there's the possibility of sort of tumbling motion in these guys, it's nice to have something that uh, I can do to fairly high order over a very short period of time. Okay, so I'm not, I don't have to worry about dissipation in this case because I'm going to reset pretty much every time step. Okay, um, so that's how that is done. Just for completeness, uh, this is how you construct the inertia tensor. It's basically, it's made of spheres, so these are the... Um, mini little inertia tensors of spheres, which is two-fifths mi ri squared times the unit matrix, and then you construct your off-axis stuff um, in the usual way, where these rows now are the um, position of the particle with respect to the center of mass of the aggregate. Okay. And then to compute the torques, it's just um, uh, r cross a, okay, for every particle, 
Um, you've already computed the A's, these, this is the accelerations, I should say. Um, and then it's, it's your position relative to the center of mass is your moment arm times the actual acceleration, uh, differential acceleration acting on your particle. You sum that up for all particles in the aggregate. And then this is in the space frame. Okay? You multiply by this matrix to get the torques in the uh, rigid body frame. And the matrix is just, uh, it's made up of the columns of principal axes. Okay? And you take the transpose if you want to go from space to body and it's not the transpose if you want to go from body to space. Um, <clears throat> and that's really, in those few slides, that's the full formal, formal, formalism you need to do rigid body mechanics to this level of approximation. Um, that is the torques, anyway. To actually work out what happens when two things collide, when they are funny shaped like this, is a little harder, okay? Um, it's because the impacts are off-axis. They're non-central, unlike sphere, sphere collisions. Um, and actually, the, the, the solution is so complex that you cannot actually permit surface friction in this formula formulation, um, at least not um, uh, generally. Okay? In special cases, you can. But, so you don't, you don't have surface friction for these rigid body collision stuff. But really, that's OK, because in some sense, off-axis collisions cause typically a much more impulsive torque than sliding friction would anyway. Okay, so you know, this, this is capturing um, sort of the physics of transfer of translational motion to rotation anyway. So it's not something that we concern ourselves with. Uh, collision prediction is also more complicated because the body's rotating. Because previously, we could, we could say that things are moving in straight lines. Okay, but now we've got something that's rotating as well as moving. Okay, and so how do you figure that out? And the answer is you end up with a quartic equation for the possible collision time. Uh, I don't want to solve quartic qu equations any time if I can avoid it. So we drop the higher order terms in T and we reduced to, again, a quadratic. So the, the moral is just choose your time step to be small. Okay. And it's still going to be just an approximation. But um, it, this looks very familiar, I hope, from the previous um, equation. With a little bit of um, extra wrinkles here. Instead of a V, we have a U. So this includes the fact that the motion is translational plus rotational. And we have uh, something here which has units of acceleration, this Q, uh, which actually looks like a centripetal term. Yeah, you, you could do it. Okay, I just haven't bothered. So in fact, it turns out that for some of my granular dynamics problems, I'm gonna have to solve a quartic equation, so which means I'm gonna have to put in a quartic solver anyway, and when I do that, I'm gonna probably come back and make this a more uh, rigorous prediction. Um, but I would wanna time it because it's not gonna be cheap, okay? Uh, you can, there are analytical ways to solve a quartic equation, which is a real mess, or you can do a, a root solver, okay? which hopefully can get you to a good solution in a very quick time. But it's a question of how much time you want to spend doing that. Um, and so it's a trade-off that needs to be investigated. Do you apply this formula to the superparticles? That is, are those S1, S2 the size of the superparticle? Or do you drop back to the individual? Right, I thank you for pointing that out. So in this equation, the S1s and S2s are the radii of individual particles, because we're looking for sphere-sphere contact. But in these sets of equations, which are the restitution equations, uh, the, these are capitals here. That's meaning we're affecting the um, bulk motion and bulk rotation of the aggregates. Yeah, thank you. And in fact, there are lots of little terms in here that I'm not going to bore you with. Okay? If you want to see what these things mean, like gamma is a geometrical factor, but it's a complicated, annoying little beast. Okay? And you also have to, do, um, you have to get the inverse of the tensors and stuff. So you pre-compute those to save time. Here's a moment arm, and so on. But basically, um, uh, once you've implemented all that and done it in as efficient a way as possible, you can smash these things together. I'm not sure I precisely understand what you mean. So you're talking about sort of the, the vibration problem? Okay, so yeah, so for the rigid bodies, um, 
you can still do that. So you can say like at, at the point of contact between the two spheres, you can set epsilon n equal to one if you predict that there's gonna be a potential problem. And so these, these rigid bodies can then be bouncing around a little bit, okay? You typically don't even notice it when you, when you look at it. Um, but if they do overlap, and it's much more likely that that's a problem here because of the approximation of when the collision will actually occur and things like that, um, then we use a repulsive force to, just to push the particles away from each other. And it, because it's repulsive force between the spheres, it nicely, it's a torque as well. Okay, so you sort of, you, you've over-rotated and then you, then you fix that rotation. So, uh, it's complicated, but uh, we're getting there. So, you all wanna see the movies, right? Okay, so here are two rigid cubes blink, that bounce. So, they have gravity, uh, they're feeling collisions. Uh, you notice they have found a nice uh, low energy state where they have two faces touching. Okay, so this thing really is vibrating a little bit, okay, but you can't see that. And I threw in a third one just to make it more interesting. And then they, they get to some mutual equilibrium uh, very quickly. Okay, so. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Here's one. <laughs> Um, so this is, that previous thing was just a test, just a, a, an illustration. Here is something put into practice. So this is work with Patrick Michel. We're interested in um, asteroid family formation. So we imagine we have a big asteroid, we just smacked it at multi kilometers per second. We use an, a, a solid state SPH code to, to uh, model the fracturing, by the way. And this gives rise to a velocity field of ejecta, which is then passed to PKD grav, and we model the ballistic trajectories of the, um, the, the pieces afterwards. And the key thing here is that gravitational reaccumulation happens. Okay, you make rubble piles as a result of this collision. Regardless of whether this was a solid body to begin with, you end up with big rubble piles at the end. And this movie is gonna concentrate on the largest remaining family member, which is, which is gonna zoom in on him. And we're using, um, we're allowing the particles to stick to form little aggregates, okay? And we've thrown in a couple rules, that if an aggregate experiences too much of stress, uh, it loses particles. And so we specify a, a bulk strength for the object in, in, in Pascals. And um, also if two aggregates hit at a fast enough speed, uh, the particles at the point of contact can be released and you can get a little chain reaction of, um, of collisional breakage that way. Uh, this is the highest resolution movie I've ever done. So here it goes. Colors indicate the history of aggregation. You notice the cosmological-like structure there that occurs. It's the same physics. It's, a, it's a basically, it's a gravitational instability that causes clumping along the um, filaments, okay? And in this case, we end up with um, a big lumpy guy, and look at this guy. Smash. <laughs> Lands on the surface, and oh, little guy, wee. Another one, he goes behind and gets destroyed. This is, what? Goes behind, what? wait. Oh, that didn't end well. <laughs> Um, this is 100,000 plus, I, I forget exactly. Uh, so the, the resolution is sort of dictated by the SPH end of the, of the code, the rigid body part. And then we have sort of one particle per SPH particle after the collision. This guy's fun. Boink. <laughs> Crunch. So the um, angular momentum is conserved. Uh, energy is not conserved because there's dissipation. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, these little guys are bouncing off the surface, so there's a little bit of energy dissipation due, due to bounces, okay? Uh, but the angular momentum of the system is conserved. We're just zooming in on the largest remnant. There's actually tons of these forming elsewhere. Okay, this is just the biggest one. So we end up with a family, uh, asteroid family with a size distribution and a velocity dispersion, which ma max, uh, matches um, actual asteroid families that we see. Now, the thing that I'd like to point out is how similar this looks to Itakawa, right, where you have like little things perched on the end like that. Now, this is somewhat artificial. I'm not claiming this is what actually happens, um, but it's, it's a nice illustration of, of what we can do. Part of the point of this is that previously, we, when we merged things, we, we turned them into spheres. Okay, so we lost a lot of information. We lost um, the, sort of a, any indication of what the shape might be. We also lost the actual spin of the shape because it was just was stuffed into a sphere, and so that has the highest, um, lowest moment of inertia, I guess, for the same angular momentum. Uh, but So here we can do a little bit better job. Also, Wolf had told us that uh, when you're expecting convergence to a system, it's always expected, which is more important. So when 
<laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I, I get your point is that basically, you know, it's not like we're going to be solving this stuff exactly. It's, just, it's more of a statistical um, realization as to, you know, if we start this with slightly different initial conditions, different time steps, and so on, we get different lumps. Okay. But the crucial thing is different shaped lumps. I mean, but the crucial thing is we always get the same mass. Okay. Because that is that's the gravity. Okay. So the gravity pulls all this stuff in, and you, you know, we're solving that exactly. Oh, exactly. Okay, and so we always end up with the same mass remnant. And details of the shape might change as a result of um, uh, stochasticity and choice of parameters and so on. What fraction of the total mass is in that picture? Fraction of the total mass in this picture is probably pushing somewhere like 30%. 30. Yeah, so, so this, was, this was a fairly large remnant. Um, okay, this is for you, Alar. <laughs> So um, Randall Perrine, my other student, is uh, looking at the formation of structure, sorry, formation of bonded aggregates inside planetary rings, okay? Because there's this idea, of, goes back to Scott Tremaine, actually, that it's possible that if there's some kind of cohesion between particles, that you could make structures that um, exist over a much larger scale, strong structures that exist at a scale larger than the individual particles. And this could explain things like, um, some of the very, very fine optical depth variations we see in Saturn's densest rings, the, the B ring. Okay, so we're, we're just beginning to explore this idea, and the first thing we had to do was put in um, the possibility for particles to grow in an aggregate fashion inside a sliding patch. So here's what that looks like. So just to give you an idea of how many aggregates we can handle simultaneously, this is um, 75,000 particles and uh, lots and lots of aggregates are formed. Uh, this is a particularly sticky case where we're making bigger and bigger things. Ultimately, what we want is some kind of equilibrium between um, the uh, impacts, sorry, the, the, the growth due to sticking plus the um, uh, breaking due to the planetary tides as well as collisions. And we'll, we're working towards trying to figure out what the equilibrium situation would be as a function of those parameters. Um, what else are we gonna say there? I forget, but anyway. We can talk about that later. So um, the homework exercise is basically to smash stuff up. Um, so if you go onto the wiki, there should be a link now to the exercise. I think all the software there is working for the cluster. Looking at Peter, I'm sure it's working. Yes. Okay. Um, so you should be able to just follow the exercise that's outlined there to just uh, reproduce a, a collision between two aggregates. And then you can just play around with the parameters and do what you like. And we'll meet together, I guess, Monday afternoon if you want to ask me questions about that. And again, I'll be here all next week. So what I'd like to do now is, since I have a little bit of time, which is great, uh, is talk a little bit about some things like uh, getting away from pure rigidity and also some of these granular dynamics experiments we're interested in. So let's first motivate this by talking a little bit about what I mean by a gravitational aggregate. So keeping in mind Itakawa, okay, that chunky little asteroid. So a gravitational aggregate, what I mean by that is a loose assemblage of coherent pieces, rocks, okay? And that entire structure could have some cohesion, okay? But it's gonna be very little. So that's why we call it a gravitational aggregate instead of a coherent aggregate. And that cohesion is what we would call tensile strength, the ability to resist being pulled apart, okay? Um, now, what's interesting about these sorts of guys is that a gravitational aggregate Okay, just left to its own devices, has shear strength. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that I could take like an ellipsoidal shape uh, made out of rubble, put it into free space with no rotation, step back, and it will stay that way. It's not gonna spontaneously flow to become a sphere like a fluid would. Okay, and the reason for that is that that aggregate has shear strength. And a way to think of this is to compare water and sand. Okay. Neither water nor sand has tensile strength. I can just pick water up and drop it like that. I can pick sand up and drop it like that. No tensile strength, okay? But sand has shear strength. When I step on the sand, it supports my weight. And the reason for that is that the, the particles underneath my foot are rubbing against each other and providing resistive force, okay? But I can't stand on water. I'll just fall through. I can't, anyway. Um, 
And so that's the difference, okay? So, so sand and gravitational aggregates have shear strength. And the, the strength is given by the gravity. So it's the fact that the thing is self-gravitating. So for example, when people are thinking about trying to get um, sample returns from an asteroid, okay? So we want to go onto the surface of an asteroid, we want to dig a hole or drill a hole or something like that. Suppose you want to drill a hole into a very weak asteroid or a very small asteroid like Itakawa. Well, what's going to happen is the spacecraft is going to lift off the surface. Right? You're not going to go into the, into the ground. So you have to somehow anchor yourself on the ground. Well, how do you do that? Well, um, on a beach on Earth, if you have a tent, you can pitch a tent in sand because the, um, uh, the stakes, will, the, sh the sand provides a shear strength which will hold the stakes in place. But at super low gravity, like on an asteroid, there's basically no strength there at all, and so those tent pegs won't work at all. So there's this, in, there's this um, big engineering effort going on right now to figure out how best to do sample returns from asteroids. And I should point out, the Hayabusa mission did attempt a sample return. And in fact, that spacecraft is on its way back to Earth with what, it hopes, what we hope is a sample of Itakawa. Um, but we don't know if it, A, got a sample, and B, if it's going to make it back to Earth because it's running on one gyro right now. It doesn't look good. But anyway, um, so a rubble pile you, you may have heard of in this context is a special case of a jumbled body with no cohesion at all. Okay, just some definitions. So what about cohesion? We know that there are objects in space that have small solar system bodies that are larger than rocks, okay? But they must have some cohesion um, because they're spinning so fast, okay? And just to illustrate that with some real data, I apologize for this. Um, so this is a light curve amplitude from a rotating body. So anything that has a high amplitude is elongated, low amplitude is very round, uh, versus spin rate, how fast it's rotating. And there's all kinds of interesting things here which I'm not gonna be able to talk about. Okay, um, but the thing that I want to emphasize is that there are some bodies that are spinning really, really fast. This is revolutions per day, okay? And there is no plausible density that they could have that would allow them to hold themselves together unless they actually have some cohesion. So we know that these bodies exist. So we should, so we would, uh, there is a, there's a motivation to modeling cohesion in gravitational aggregates. We have a couple data points of strengths. Uh, comets SL9 broke up at Jupiter, and Temple 1, which is the uh, target of the Deep Impact mission, we know that the strengths, upper strength was about 100 pascals, really, really small. Again, if you go back to sneezing, if you were to sneeze on this stuff, it would just fly apart. It's that, that weak. And, and yes, we did measure the pressure of a sneeze. <coughs> there is essentially no data for asteroids. So how do we model cohesion, and what effect does it have? Okay, um, this is the stuff that Steve Schwartz is working on, who's participating in this workshop. So what we do here is we add um, a restoring force, a Hooke's law between nearby particles, little springs. We don't actually model the springs. We're just saying that there's an extra little force between the particles, okay? And these, um, we allow these objects to deform elastically up to some maximum strain beyond which we cut the, the spring, okay? And so, um, so we, we specify a stress limit, and we specify the Young's modulus, which is how, how um, rigid that spring is. And it's important to realize that what we're doing here now is sort of changing the paradigm, that the particles are acting as tracers of a solid. It's no longer correct to think of the particles individually, okay? It's tracers of a solid, kind of more like SPH in that sense, okay? And we were not dealing with bonded aggregates. We're not going to be solving Euler's equation of rigid body rotation. These aren't rigid. We, we actually just solved the equation of motion of um, gravity, plus collisions, plus extra spring force. Okay. And when you do that, um, you get cool movies, which is always high on the agenda. So this is, um, we take a, a body that's spinning way too fast if it had um, no cohesion at all, okay? And in fact, it's spinning too fast for the cohesion that we have given it, which is uh, given by uh, these parameters, the Young's modulus and the stress limit. Spinning pretty fast, pretty oblate. We're looking down the rotation axis, pretty flat. Here's what happens. Okay, you can see how these are nicely lumpy. Okay, they kind of look asteroidy. Right? And it's just because of this extra little um, strength we've given between the particles this, uh, due to the springs. They do dissipate energy, yeah. So in fact, we're still modeling collisions between the particles, okay? And once a spring is broken, by the way, we don't reform it. It's just a free-floating particle. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so there is dissipation as well as deformation. 
And here are some experiments that uh, Steve has been carrying out. Basically, we want to be able to compare our rather simple model of um, body strength to things you can actually do in the lab. So for example, I could take a, a slab of material and I can pull on the blue plates, okay? And here I'm gonna pull slowly on these blue plates, blue plates on something and see what happens. So breaks in half, okay? So that's what you'd expect with the slow pull. And then the next one is a fast pull. And in this case, you can break somewhere other than at the center. It actually looks slower, but that's just because we stepped it slower. Um, but basically, it ripped off the plates rather than ripping at the center of the body. And then you can do things like, okay, how does it behave under shear? Pull, and then eventually it breaks. Okay. Um, and so the goal of this exercise is basically to um, compare with laboratory experiments and then uh, make things a little more sophisticated. We don't want to go too crazy, okay, because there are numerical methods to deal with solid bodies. That's SPH, okay? Um, but we can, in principle, do much more, some subtly more complicated things um, that in a regime that SPH has a hard time doing. And so they, they will complement each other quite well. I'm working with Patrick and Michelle on that. And uh, someone wanted colliding cubes with deformation. So these are two cubes with um, spring forces colliding. Crunch. And so you've you've implanted a deformation in the object which remains um, there after the, the contact. And then, of course, you always want to smash these things faster, right? See what happens. Again, it's going to look slower, but it really is faster. And you can break stuff off. And so you see large chunks coming off, okay, as well as individual pieces. And the color code means something, which is, I can talk to you about later. Uh, no, and in fact, it, come back next month. So that's the topic that Steve is working on right now. Is basically, we'll, so at the moment we have one uniform Y and L for the whole body, okay? But next we're going to put for each spring, there's going to be its own Y and L. And so you'll be able to build in pre existing uh, weaknesses, fractures, Weibull distribution of flaws, all of that stuff. Um, and that's probably as sophisticated as we'll go um, for the previously mentioned reasons. Okay, so uh, we've been applying these models to rotational disruption models, the formation of binary asteroids, which I love to talk about, but we'll have to do that offline, um, comparing with laboratory experiments as well, and here's what you just asked. So the next step is to allow for individual spring strengths in order to um, put in pre-existing weaknesses. Okay, just got enough time for one more cool thing. So remember way back at the start of the talk, I showed you um, particles going in funnels and, and things like that. Well, we've come back to that now, but we're doing it in full 3D and uh, with arbitrary walls and stuff. It's very cool. And it's actually motivated to understand the granular dynamics in the very weak gravity regime. Okay. And so what we want to be able to do is develop simulations numerically uh, that we can perform at very low G and then compare with actual experiments that are conducted at very low G. And so the approach is um, I've written some I think very pretty code, to put in wall primitives. You can specify walls of any shape and orientation, and they can move, and they can rotate and stuff. Um, and basically, the idea is to be able to replicate experimental apparatus. Uh, so here is a, an example. So we have um, a bunch of particles inside a cylinder here. I've got little translucent walls so you can see through. This is an infinite plane. And it's inclined because it can be. <laughs> I just let these things go and we see what happens. And as you'd expect, they all collect at the uh, lowest point in the gravity field. Boink, boink, boink. Yay. Done. Okay. Um, and then you can get more complicated. So there's this thing called a taylor Couette shear cell, which is um, it's an experiment that's done in geophysics to understand um, how granular material behaves under shear. Okay, and the, the, the setup is you have an outer cylinder and an inner cylinder, and you fill the space between with particles. Okay, the inner cylinder is rotating, and the outer cylinder is, uh, remains fixed. And then friction between the inner cylinder and the particles drives 
um, uh, motion throughout the cell. And then what they're interested in experimentally is uh, how big is the shear layer as a function of various parameters, what is the um, resistive torque on the cylinder, and all of these things. And we, we, we can, in principle, measure all that. Uh, so here's a little simulation as we work towards this, um, to doing these actual experiments. Here I'm just going to drop, drop four big clumps of balls into the thing. And to make it more interesting, my outer cylinder uh, wall is also rotating because I can. And you can see that the outer cylinder is rotating like this, and it drives a lot of bulk motion. But you see how there's a little bit of resistance there? So the inner cylinder is, is counter-rotating. Let me run that again. So you watch. So it's rotating like this, but then they all get forced to move this way. But eventually, we start to resist again. And so the, the layers where these things, uh, uh, where the patterns change direction and so on, are of great interest to granular physicists. And uh, we can, in principle, model this now in, uh, in any gravitational field we'd like. And the point of all of this is to actually compare with real experiment. And it is in the process of being built. So here is the outer cylinder. Uh, this is Naomi Murdoch, who's a graduate student working on this project. Uh, she's holding the motor that will drive through here, this, the inner cylinder, which they have to um, gear down to be a very, very small rotation. Uh, so she's going to build all of this, fill it full of beads, and then she's going to go on the European Vomit Comet. And she's going to fly this experiment on 30 parabolas, like this, to measure the shear flow in the Taylor Cowett cell at low gravity. So um, I'm glad it's her and not me. OK, so I've just about finished then. So. Uh, just to summarize, uh, physical collisions in n-body codes can be enabled by neighbor finding and solving the collision equations. Uh, to do the rigid body problem, you need to additionally solve Euler equations, and you need to have more complex uh, collision prediction and resolution. Applications range from planet formation to granular dynamics. Stop there. Thank you. We have a little bit of time before lunch for questions, or you can catch me offline. Anything pressing right now? Okay. There are lots of questions during the talk, so see you at lunch. Don't forget, there's the uh, merchandise sale on the floor above the...